And here's the promise from Jeremiah 33. And I think that that's the best way to understand what's going on in the death of Jesus Christ. But all of those promises are yet to be fulfilled. All right. Well, welcome Cypress Bible Church to our question and answer video series where we will be taking uh, questions that are submitted through our online form and answering them week by week according to uh, according to the sermon topic. So just a word of introduction, these won't be you know thorough or complete uh, answers, but we'll do our best to give just additional context and maybe direct you to some additional resources as we um, as we explore each of these topics. So let's start go ahead and start with the first uh, questions here. We're gonna take a few that relate to, um, Easter Sunday and what we've been talking about uh, in the resurrection. And the first question is, is this. It says, is a donkey colt the same as a horse colt? It is an animal which has never been ridden before, not a broken to ride. So just a question I'm assuming here about the triumphal entry and particularly uh, what is this reference to a colt or a donkey? Um, so a couple, couple of thoughts on that. Um, number one, I think there's been some discussion actually about whether there was a donkey or or a, a, a colt, a, a baby horse that's being referenced here, or both. And actually, Matthew chapter 21, uh, Jesus tells his disciples, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. So we're talking about two animals here. And there's been a couple different theories on exactly what's, or different suggestions anyway, about what's being referenced here. And I think the best suggestion is that Jesus asked for both animals to be brought to him and then rides into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey. And certainly this would have been uh, miraculous in the sense that if the donkey had never been ridden, never been um, trained to have a rider mount it, uh, he would have bucked him off or been wild in some way, but here we have uh, Jesus subduing the donkey and the donkey obediently following its master's commands. So in that sense, it's miraculous. But I think there's another uh, element to the text here um, symbolically, and that is donkeys in uh, in ancient times certainly were the the animal of choice for royalty. So we see David riding his donkey, um, David giving his donkey to his son Solomon to ride as a symbol of royalty. So for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, not a war animal, it's a time of peace, would have certainly symbolized something to the nation. So, so that's uh, probably just some thoughts around that question. Okay, the second uh, question here. Um, relates to, again, the triumphal entry. Here's the question. The welcome that the people gave Jesus shouting, Hosanna, where did they get the idea that he was their earthly savior? Jesus never spoke about their oppression with, with the Romans, and everything he spoke about was of submission and forgiveness. Maybe it's like what we do today. Sometimes we hear what we want to hear. So this is a great question. And uh, I one that I love to answer because the, the 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 answer to the question in a sentence, where did they get this idea that Jesus would save them from Rome? We can answer that in a single sentence. They got it from the Old Testament. Consider maybe a famous Christmas passage that we read in Isaiah chapter nine, verse seven. Um, speaking of the Messiah, it says. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. That's Isaiah 9 verse 7. So here we have this prophecy of Messiah that one day there would be a future king who would establish his throne forever. So, you know, what are they thinking? They're thinking Davidic king, a king like unto David. They're not thinking anything else. If we move forward to Isaiah chapter 11, listen to how Isaiah puts it here. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what he sees 
or decide disputes by what he hears, but with righteousness she shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. So again, we see this picture of this future messianic deliverer striking the earth with the rod of his mouth and killing the wicked. Who would the people in the first century have associated with the wicked? Certainly the Romans. Um, Psalm 45, listen to this. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach your awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The people fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of, of righteousness. Um, one more text here I want to draw our attention to. Jeremiah 33, verses 15 to 21. And again, just picture the Old Testament saint in Babylon, in captivity, looking forward to... to the messianic deliverer, then comes Medo-Persia, then comes Greece, then comes Rome, and now you just you're just waiting, you're just waiting in anticipation for this rope for this messianic deliverer to come. And here's the promise from Jeremiah 33. In those days, and at that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which I will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And the Levitical police shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. So do you see the picture of what they were looking forward to. They were looking forward to this messianic king who would save them politically. Now we know that Jesus came to not establish an earthly kingdom his first time, but to die for our sins. But all of those promises are yet to be fulfilled in the future millennial kingdom where Jesus does reign for a thousand years and does fulfill the promises that he made in the Old Testament. So it's a very good question. The where did Jesus, where did the Jews of Jesus' day get this idea? And the answer is they got it from the Old Testament. Okay, so a third question comes uh, comes to us here. It's relating the death of Jesus uh, during the Passion Week. It says this: Please describe the nature of Jesus' death. What did that mean? Apparently, he was still upholding the universe by the power of his word, according to Hebrews 1, verse 3, during death. What was the relationship of the Holy Spirit to Jesus during his death? It is clear that all three members of the Godhead raised Jesus from the dead. God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, according to Romans 6, 4, Galatians 1, 1, and Acts 2, 32. Jesus had the authority to raise himself from the dead, John 10, 18. And in John 2.19, he predicts that he will raise himself from the dead. And the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, according to 1 Peter 3.18. So why all three were all three necessary? Please comment. Okay, so there's a lot, a lot in that question. First of all, the first thing to say is that the Godhead, by definition, is going to be mysterious to us. We're not going to be able to, with our finite minds understand the infinite nature of the Godhead. It would be concerning to me if I was able to understand God, because I would think I must be off track. There's no way I could understand the infinite nature of God. So this Trinity is mysterious, and stay tuned in the weeks to come in our Theology Matter series, because we'll be taking uh, one of these persons of the Godhead each week and diving into some of these details more specifically. But let's just say this. I'm going to answer one thing about your question. You, you, you say here, please describe the nature of Jesus's death. What did that mean? This is, this is a, again, a very complicated, uh, very mysterious concept. But, but I think the way that I like to conceive of it 
is that any that sin is fundamentally a debt that needs to be repaid. Um, think of it in terms of uh, a, a vase, a very valuable vase that maybe you own. And someone comes in, and this is it's of infinite value. It, it could never be replaced. And someone comes in and smashes that piece of pottery. Now, there is, a, there is a loss that has taken place there, an infinite loss. And, and somebody, in order for that relationship to be made right, somebody has to absorb that loss. Who's it going to be? So, so as the owner of the vase, I could either direct my, the, the loss to the person who committed the crime and say, you must repay me and until... You have repaid me the full debt that is owed. We can never have a relationship. We are going to be at odds forever. Um, That's one option. The other option is is I can absorb that loss in myself. And I think that that's the best way to understand what's going on in the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus, our sin, has broken the relationship between us and God. There is a fundamental debt that is owed God by virtue of the way we have conducted ourselves, a sin that we have committed against him. And he can either hold us accountable for it or he can absorb it in himself. And the cross is exactly what that means for him to absorb in himself the penalty of sin. So I think that's probably maybe maybe a little bit overly simplistic, but gives a very good picture for what's going on uh, in the crucifixion event.